Ready? Ready. Three, two, one. This is The Jungle, an up-close, unvarnished look inside leadership and business strategy. We wade into the real-world leader's face and explore what they do to create a path forward. Because that's what business is. Wild, exciting, it's The Jungle. Derek, welcome back to The Jungle. It's, it's, it's good to be back in the jungle, Doug, living here. So uh, you get your lawn mowed yet? The, the, uh, it, it sounds like lawn mowing is, is it now an essential service. Is, is that happening for you? I, you know what? My wife has been screaming at me to ask where the lawnmower uh, group is. Uh, my group hasn't come by yet. I, I, I pay for that service. I, I like the service that they do. But they're just getting back to work yesterday. I have not made the rounds to my house yet, um, which is tough. But uh, hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. How about you? Is your, is your grass all dialed in, like straight lines, all cut? No, it should. It should be cross hatched right now. It's it's not. Um, but it it's not the case that uh, I I actually have people mowing my lawn. But you told me that there were robots in your neighborhood mowing lawns. Is that yeah, true? It, it is true. So I go out for really early morning runs. I, I'm by myself. There's no cars, no people, and I, I actually I'm starting to see a lot more of the robotic lawnmowers. Um, I guess they're GPS controlled or they, they know how, where your lawn is, where the trees are, and they just kind of robot mow your lawn. Uh, I've seen, I think I saw 15 the other morning, which was, I, I saw one last year and I saw 15 this morning. Trend. Don't know. It's, un, it's unbelievable. Uh, you know, you think about some of the other guests talking about technology being here faster than you think, you know, that's, that's, that might be a, that might be a sign. Yeah. And, and, and on top of that, I, I forgot, I went for a bike ride yesterday with my kids. We tried to stay six feet and one of those lawnmowers was out and they stopped and they asked if they could ride it. And I said, no, <laughs> probably, probably can't do that. <laughs> but um, but I, I, I think they're growing in frequency, at least in my neighborhood. I don't know if it's just uh, keeping yeah. up with the neighbors or whatever it is, but all right. So let's talk about our guest or let's do we it. A, we have a special guest today. Special guest today. So we uh, had the great pleasure of speaking with Fred Upton. Uh, who is our uh, U.S. representative here in Michigan's 6th District. Uh, Fred has been in Congress since 1987 and really had a distinguished impact there. Uh, former chairman of the Committee on Energy and Commerce, one of the most powerful uh, committees that we have uh, in the United States uh, Congress. He's been in involved with a lot of important legislation. Uh, one of the things that he has been speaking a lot about lately is around civility and the importance of bipartisanship. So Debbie Dingell, uh, a Democrat, and, and, and himself has, have written a few things on this in the Detroit News, uh, but really a proponent of trying to find common ground uh, amongst competing interests. So uh, he, providing a great view uh, for our listeners on kind of behind the scenes of what it's like in Congress during this time um, and how you lead through this, this crisis. Um, so what were, your, what were your takeaways there, Derek? Yeah, great conversation uh, from him at his kitchen table where he's doing all his business um, through iPads and, and multiple phones. Uh, so a th couple takeaways. The one, uh, you know, we, we kind of asked, what, what do you see in the future getting back? And he said, safety. Employees got to be safe. So everyone's got to start thinking about safety of employees and consumers first, um, which I liked. The resources around that, we've got to have the resources to get to those safe positions that requires a lot, which uh, companies need to start preparing for. Uh, we probably the one nation that might be able to do that. Uh, and then testing, you know, I think he sees along with that is testing, you know, we hear a lot about the news, but I think he's starting to see some maybe potential breakthroughs. That, that was reassuring to me, that, was, that made me feel good. Um, and then I, I guess I had, a, I'll stop with this takeaway and I'll give it back to you, Doug, but you know, the importance of relationships and networks um, we tell our students about this. There's a lot written in, in our research and management about networks and, and working your network and building strong, solid uh, relationships with the foundation of trust and how critical they are right now at this time when you're in your house and can you call someone and get something done still? And if you don't have a deep relationship and you don't have that network built out, it just becomes that much harder. Um, you know, we kind of see that from our center where we're, our center is just starting and we're trying to build a, a bigger network and, and, and to really impact a lot of people, but it's hard to do without a big network. Um, and, and, and how important that is and, and those solid relationships. So that's a, that's a key point for anybody right now. You know, even we're not in pandemic, you should be working on building relationships and network with people all the time um, and, and figuring out how you can provide value to others uh, and how critical that is right now. 
uh, really important takeaway from there. What'd you, what'd you have, Doug? What was, what was your kind of takeaways from, what'd you, what'd you focus in on? I'm going to go with, uh, I'm just going to go with one big one with a lot of sub points, which was uh, some of Fred's really amazing work with the Problem Solvers Caucus. So if you haven't heard about this, the Problem Solvers Caucus is a bipartisan group of uh, United States House of Representatives. Uh, seems like 50 members now equally divided between Democrats and Republicans. And it's really a way for uh, a mechanism for bipartisanship and working through some difficult issues. And this was what Fred talked about uh, with our questions around competing interests. Everyone knows the, the rancor and uh, uh, partisanship and name calling and everything else that's going on uh, in Congress. And I thought his, his insight here around the Problem Solvers Caucus was really important as we think about leading in the context of competing interests. Business and organizations aren't served by eliminating diversity. We're, we're, they are all better off by fostering diversity, uh, diversity of thought, new perspectives. Uh, and so I thought some of his ideas and what they're doing in the Problem Solvers Caucus was really interesting, had some translatable lessons here. So the first one, uh, to get into this uh, caucus, you, there has to be, you have to come in with another member. So it's, uh, if you come in as a Democrat, you have to bring a, a Republican with you. Uh, you sign a pledge. So there's actually a commitment pledge that you, that you end up uh, signing. Uh, this caucus meets uh, once, once a week at least. So there's regular communication that helps with building uh, relationships. Uh, they're told to, quote, leave their party at the door as, as an important part of their uh, process, a commitment to secrecy and a commitment not to campaign against one another. And you think about, you know, those, those practices, uh, those all are about building trust and finding uh, common ground. And it sure sounds like this caucus is making a bigger impact on, on policy. Uh, is it not? I mean, they're, 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 at, the, they're at the table now, uh, as you said. And so I think it's a great example of um, what is possible by unifying people with different perspectives that come to uh, answers to really difficult problems, because that's what they're facing. So uh, really great conversation. Um, and uh, we hope our listeners enjoy this conversation with Congressman Fred Upton. The Jungle is produced by the Center for Principled Leadership and Business Strategy in Western Michigan University's Hayworth College of Business. Our center supports the leadership and business strategy major, conducts large-scale consulting projects, and trains professionals in acquiring and operating small businesses. To learn more, visit wmich.edu forward slash leadership center. Fred Upton, welcome to the podcast. You bet. So Fred, tell us a little bit about uh, where you are today. What, what room is this? Where are you? Well, I'm in my kitchen. This has been my office for the last month, uh, really since uh, mid-March, uh, when Congress in essence adjourned. We've been back just two days, uh, two days worth of votes in between them, important days. Uh, so I go back uh, one of the times and halfway the other. But in any case, this has been my office. Uh, all of my staff, when we decided to physically close our offices uh, because of coronavirus, we all made sure that they've got devices, iPads, or phones. Uh, we can monitor calls coming into our offices, but everybody has been working out of their home. And we're doing a lot of casework. Uh, people are calling me between uh, the stimulus checks that went out to, to working with small businesses on the PPP uh, program to individual cases. I think we've gotten people out of uh, nearly 20 different countries, you know, students that are abroad. Uh, we had a uh, a woman who was a, her contract ended on a cruise ship. She was, I think, an, an entertainer and she had been on the ship for 40 days. And I said, you know, even Noah wasn't on the ship longer than 40 days, but her contract ended and she had been in the Bahamas. It made port for just a couple hours in Fort Lauderdale. And she got the word that the captain was not going to let her off and they were going to sail to Spain. She, of course, had no test positive or anything like that. So we went, went all the way up the chain uh, to the White House to make sure that she could get off. Her parents were there waiting for her. I think they would have thrown her a life jacket if she had jumped uh, from the ship to make sure she didn't stay on the ship any longer. They told her, drive straight to Michigan, don't stop at a hotel, wear a mask, and you're gonna be 14 days uh, you know, sequestered uh, on your own just to make sure you don't have it. And you know, those are just some of the issues that we're all, all hands on deck is what we call it. Everybody's working out of their kitchen. So that, that's me here. I actually do a report 
uh, almost every day. And so if you go to our website, upton.house.gov, easy to remember, you'll see that I do a kitchen table report. My wife does a, a picture. Maybe you know, she's on a, a Zoom call herself, but maybe she'll do a picture here and that'll be our picture for the day. But I give you a little report about 5.30 or 6 uh, every night in terms of some of the activities that I'm working on, working with my colleagues, doing a lot of Zoom calls, a lot of conference calls, and working really with our delegation from the governor on down, our senators, uh, all the members of the Michigan delegation. But I'm also in a group called Problem Solvers Caucus. Uh, we, we're meeting on, a, on the, a Zoom probably at least two hours a week, talking about what we're doing, how we can help each other, talking about legislation that, that's coming up uh, where we can either sign letters of support. You know, it's, it's going to be a lot different uh, when we go back to D.C. And already they canceled the votes for this next week. But it's going to be a lot different because 435 people in one room voting, you've got to make sure that all the precautions are there so that, that people don't get sick. Uh, so we've been actually voting by alphabet. I'm at the end of the alphabet. So it takes an hour to vote just for one vote. Now, you know, there's a lot of days that we might have 20 votes. So that's not gonna happen anymore, I don't think. We really not, gotta work together to get things done prior to a bill actually getting to the floor. So uh, you you must be going really strong. Do you have a do you have a cup of coffee with you or you got a beverage with you? Cheers. Hello. Cheers. And I, I've always had a rule, no coffee after lunch. That shows- <laughs> so, There you go. I've, well, I've kept that rule. So, you know, one, you know, what we want to do on this podcast is really take people, you know, up close inside of what it's like to be leading and thinking about strategy. And so, you know, we want to kind of a behind the scenes. So what has it been like? You've been through several crises in Congress. Uh, can you just walk us into the, uh, give us a behind the curtain view of kind of what this has been like for you and, and, and other people in Congress? Well, it's been really different. Um, you know, part of what makes Congress work is the relationships, the network, the trust that you have with your, with your colleagues. We all come from different districts. Uh, for me, you know, I, I worked at the White House before I ran for Congress. I was in charge of Congressional Affairs at the Office of Management and Budget under President Reagan. He had a divided Congress then, you know, divided government, Republican, Democrat. Uh, he got a lot of things done. And I've always kept that um, philosophy, I guess you could say, as a member of Congress. So there's not an issue uh, that I've worked on that I haven't tried to make it bipartisan with lots of successes. This is, this is really different, but it's, it's probably harder for the, quote, freshmen who really haven't had the time to establish those relationships. Maybe they're not on a major committee like Energy and Commerce, a committee that I chaired for a number of different years. But we're all, and you've got to, you know, you've got to be very cognizant. When you're on a Zoom call, you know, you, 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 not everybody can speak at the same time, right? Otherwise, nobody can hear anybody. So we have actually a little system. I mean, I'm glad that I kept my hard line. Uh, phone because I got that. I got my cell phone. I got my wife's cell phone, and I got my iPad. And so I can, I can, I can be on maybe two or three calls uh, at the same time, listening in and, and weighing in. Actually, part of the the Zoom issue is, uh, particularly with the Problem Solvers Caucus. This is 50 members, equally divided, Republican and Democrat, four from Michigan. And if you want to get into the queue, you actually text. The, the chair or the co-chair of the problem solvers and they put you in the list and then when it's your turn you go but you know you, you're you're using all the different devices you can to get things done now lots of bills to co-sponsor lots of lots of letters to write to whether it be the president or a cabinet secretary uh, members uh, on both sides uh, we're, we're listening to, and working with our leadership on both sides Nancy Pelosi is going to be a guest on the problem solver Zoom call next week. Steve Scalise, our Republican whip, was the guest uh, this last week. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin, we're probably talking to him virtually every week. And we've got everybody's cell numbers uh, so that we can reach out. But it's different. I mean, part of the magic, or maybe, uh, you know, part of, the, part of the way that Congress works is because you know people, you know, when you have a vote, there's a lot of conversation. You're looking for people on both sides of the aisle. You've got 
trust, you know, what, what, what is the issue that you're, you're looking forward to working on maybe even a couple of weeks out. I'm working on a couple of big issues now, not ready to unveil it today, but you know, we're working with the leadership on both sides, Denny Hoyer, Nancy Pelosi, Kevin McCarthy, Steve Scalise, the white house, uh, different industry types. Hopefully we'll be ready maybe by the end of the week. And this will be an issue to gin up the economy and really see a light at the end of the tunnel when this thing all gets done. And if it works, it'll be really exciting. Uh, it'll so, be exciting primarily for our constituents across the country, knowing so, that they, they're, they're back to work. So, so how do you, um, you know, obviously the role of government is changing in this whole pandemic. It's a lot of new things to deal with. How do you guys defining like your role, um, especially yourself, what is your role? What do you see as your role as someone that's a senior, maybe freshman, don't have the same relationships and network that you do, so they're finding a little harder. Um, how are you, you setting your priorities in your role, you know, as you wake up every morning in your kitchen table after your coffee? You know, what do you see well, you, the major things you guys are focusing on? You know, I did a, a conference call earlier this week, um, and a question, and this was not with my colleagues, uh, but this was, you know, a constituent deal. And I think the first question was sort of like, what are you guys doing? I mean, are you working? I mean, we don't see you around. I mean, you're not at the Rotary Club or a point tour. Or you're doing the stand-up interview or something like that. Sort of like, you know, maybe we don't need con. And it's like, well, here's my day. You know, I'm starting at 6 or 6.30 in the morning. And I'm working till at least 8 or 9 at, at night, uh, weekends as well. And it's different be just because of the, the means of communication that, that we are now forced to have uh, with, you know, like, like today, a, a podcast with you, but I'm here all by myself. I'm lucky I have a, a dozen staff people. They're all kitchens or their living rooms as well. We have a staff call every morning, so we communicate with each other. But as I work with my colleagues, I mean, we we respect each other. Um, I got to say, and uh, you know, I, Debbie Dingle's a, a, a vice chair like I am of the Problem Solvers Caucus. We have four members from Michigan. We probably talk four or five times a day. And she's holed up in her kitchen over in Dearborn. Uh, we have a call tomorrow, a delegation call uh, to all, you know, all of us, 14 members of the House, to uh, both senators, uh, with, the, with the chairman of Ford Motor Company. You know, the auto industry, uh, like it or not, is a pretty big industry here in Michigan. And with them shut down and all their suppliers, he's going to give his view of, you know, where things are and what can we do. Uh, I'm a member of the Auto Caucus. I was once a co-chair of it. Uh, but what can we do to help them? get people back to work, obviously make sure that their employees are safe. Uh, and it's just, it's, it's really a listening role uh, that we're trying to do is, is we try to work together knowing that, you know, there's never been a time like this. Just, just never. I, uh, I might recommend a book. It's a, it's over here on the, on the side. Uh, it's called the road. It's uh, written by a guy that I, I read uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, something has happened in America. I don't know what it was. It doesn't talk about that, but there's no electricity. The grid's down. It's been like that for a long time, and there's anarchy. A lot of people are dead. And this uh, story of a young father who takes his son in a, in a grocery cart, because it's got good ball bearings, cars you can't have, no electricity, so he can't fill up with gas. Not a lot of people, so he's got he's to uh, evade you know, marauders and gangs that are out there, but they're going like house to house, uh, breaking in, getting the cans of tuna, whatever might be in their, in their pantry, surviving, going literally from Colorado to Florida. And it just goes to show you how the world can change. I mean, this is obviously a fiction book. It was actually on Oprah's uh, Regan list uh, 10 years ago. It's a New York Times bestseller. But that's a point that nobody wants to get to. I mean, we have to survive this. And the only way that we're going to survive this is to work together and make sure that, um, you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and we are, frankly, the only nation on the, on, the, on the planet, I think, that actually has the resources to allow us to emerge from this uh, with some, um, you know, at some point down the road. And, you know, as we had a, a conference call yesterday with former Treasury Secretary under Obama, uh, J Jack Lew, 
uh, he made the same point that the head of the business round table made last week. Uh, and also he had been a former OMB director under Bush. You know, months from now, if somehow it comes back, you'll, you, you need to do what you can today because you don't want a few months from now to wonder, man, if we'd only done this, we might be better off. Because if it does come back, if we are in a serious situation, say this fall or you know, later on, we will be in a weaker economic position than we are in today. So let's try to fix it today. Uh, work with our health providers, uh, our hospitals and others to work with our states and our communities. And it's, you know, sort of Katie bar the door to make sure that we emerge from this now and just have just one hit. So rather than perhaps a harder hit a number of months from now. And I think that's where most of us are. Uh, well, Fred, when you, when you, so this is, uh, you've mentioned the problem sol uh, solver caucus and the, you know, putting this, this situation um, into a kind of a bigger context, you know, we know that you're, um, you know, a big pro pro uh, proponent of around civility, around bipartisanship, um, trying to find, you know, common ground. And, you know, one, I think, really interesting perspective that you can share with listeners is how you can lead in a context where you have competing interests competing values, diversity of thought. And you know, a lot of the bu businesses out there are trying to figure out how do I leverage my diversity? I don't want maybe people to compromise on their principles. I want them to keep their principles, but we need to find a way to move forward together. So what is your, what have you learned? Like, let's talk like really tactically. H how do you do that in an environment where people are, are so polarized and you're trying to, th you're, you're, you're dealing with trade-offs right now, economic versus health open up versus closed. How do you, what do you see in the, what's the recommendation for how people can lead in that context of competing interests? Well, I'll tell you what makes problem solvers successful. Uh, we all, we all signed a civility pledge. Uh, we meet every week. I mean, there's not a week, week that goes by that we don't meet um, for at least an hour. Um, it's again, it's 50 members. Uh, there, there's a little criteria, I mean, uh, for you to be accepted in our group, it's not quite like a fraternity or sorority, but there are some rules. And one of the rules is you leave your party label at the door. Um, everybody's equal. And you make a commitment, you know, this crazy political world that you live in as well. You make a commitment that what's said in there stays there, so there's no leaks. Um, no one's trying to be high gluten over, over somebody else or get an edge. But we also make a commitment that none of us are going to work against someone who's in our group. So that means you're not going to go out and campaign against them. You're not going to participate in any way. So that you can have a real trust uh, with what you say and, and how you work together. And that's, that's important in sort of the gotcha style politics that, you know, often you, you see, particularly on, you know, 24 seven TV. Uh, and that, you know, and, and we've had some real successes. I, I got to tell you that we were the group that actually met with the president uh, a year, a little more than a year ago to end the 35 day shutdown. It was a bipartisan group. We went down, we met in a situation with the president. He knew who the Democrats were because he had campaigned against them. He went around the room, got a little, uh, but we were the ones, we were sort of the architects of getting the door open. We changed, and we also changed the rules of the house uh, where we, we told the, the, the Dems, because they're in the majority, and they told the speaker that they would not support her for the speakership if she didn't accept more bipartisanship, changing the rules. And had the Republicans kept the majority, we would have done the same thing. In fact, you know, Kevin McCarthy is one of my best friends. He's the Republican leader in the House. He'd be speaker if Republicans were in charge. But I told Kevin in the fall of 18, I said, Kevin, don't count on my vote because if you don't agree to these changes that we're going to insist on, we're going to hold back our, on our vote for speaker and we got enough to, uh, to do that. So when we had the coronavirus, Again, the president called us down. Uh, we met with the vice, well, maybe it was with the vice president. The president wasn't in that meeting, but it was in the, in the situation room. Uh, they just named Deborah Burks, a very accomplished, you know, everybody knows who she is now, but this was literally her first day on the job. 
But we went around the room again, what can we do to work together uh, to confront this thing? Because if we're not together, if we don't have a plan, we're in big trouble. And you know, that was before we passed the CARES Act, $2.2 trillion. Oh my goodness. We never had a bill anywhere close to that. And we ran out of money for the PPP program, Paycheck Protection uh, Program, which is a small business plan. Again, newly devised, run through this a small business administration. They don't possibly have the resources anywhere, which is why they use credit unions and banks. That was sort of came out of our group, but we all voted for it. And guess what? Two weeks later was out of money. And we all came back last week to make sure that there was another $300 billion in the pipeline to help those small businesses. So in that, in that, in that context, when you have, because in that group, you've got Republicans and you've got, you've got Democrats, so people with different philosophies. Um, how how in, your, in, your, in that caucus, in that group, do you come to a, a common consensus and a point of view when you've got people with different ideas? So we have the rule. The, the other thing that we have in this sort of an entry so we'll put out a proposal, um, and the two leaders are Republican and a Democrat, Tom Reed from New York, Josh Gothheimer from New Jersey, and we'll work on a proposal, and I'm one of the vice chairs, multiple vice, but we'll come up with a proposal, and then we'll ship it out to the other 50 members, uh, and we'll say, do you support this or not? And the deal is that if 75% of each side 75% of the 25 Republicans and 75% of the 25 Democrats, if they're a yes, then we vote as a block. We are together. Um, we did that on immigration reform. We passed a major immigration reform. Most people didn't hear about it because that was during the whole saga of the impeachment stuff uh, last December. But we have working groups on that. We have a working group on you know, on the coronavirus and, and where we are. We, we were all together on the PPP. Nobody. Uh, you know, a, a different line. People are reminded that we're together because unified, it's pretty hard to beat us. And as a consequence, the leadership on both sides, they, they, they were at the table. We're mm -hmm. at the table with, uh, you know, Steny and uh, Speaker Pelosi, I call her Nancy, we're the same class. Um, so we've always had a, you know, very personal relationship that way. But it's the same way with uh, Kevin and uh, Steve Scalise. They want to know where we are because they don't want to be wrong. They don't want to be. Uh, so, you know, and particularly as we deal with this issue, we have to be bipartisan. I mean, there is, uh, you know, we, you know, at, at this point, not only have we had colleagues that have been, you know, l frankly, lucky to survive this uh, illness, but we've got staffers. We've got, uh, I was told yesterday uh, by one of my DC staff, I guess there were nearly a dozen uh, capital workers uh, that came down positive uh, who, who work in the architect of the Capitol's office. So we all know people. You know, the first person that died here in Berrien County, I know his, his picture's been on my desk for a couple of years. Uh, Vietnam vet who was actually up for the Medal of Honor. He's wounded 13 times. Um, he and his wife got it. He was a chaplain at the hospital. Two days he was, he was gone. Um, so we all know people, you know, you, you see those stories on the, on the news and they often run pictures or, you know, uh, different people. We all know now people impacted by this. When I flew back last week to D.C., I drove to Detroit um, because you know, we don't know the, the plane service we did before. I drove to Detroit. I got on the plane and uh, there was a guy from Problem Solvers, uh, Ben McAdams. He's a Democrat from Utah. Uh, they don't have a direct flight anymore from Salt Lake to D.C., uh, even though they're both hubs. So he flew to Detroit and, you know, hopped on my plane. He got coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, uh, back in March. Uh, and he uh, he was hospitalized. He said it was like a vice on his chest, just squeezing, squeezing, squeezing. He was on 85% uh, oxygen, probably little, he's only in his 40s. So that probably helped him uh, survive. He's already now a blood donor. We're using his plasma to get the platelets uh, uh, to help other people uh, who are really even in worse shape than he was uh, to be able to survive. And so, you know, that's, I mean, we're all, and we were checking in with him, checking in with his family. Um, got another guy, Mario Diaz-Ballard. He's like a brother to me. Um, 
He's uh, from South Florida, not Miami. Uh, he got it as well. I was asked, and I, I was with him prior to when he came down. They, they checked with me just to see if I should be on a self uh, quarantine for 14 days. Uh, they decided, the doctor said, didn't think that I had to, um, uh, but I was very careful. Uh, but, you know, he's, he still had a fever. He's now clear, but he had a fever that wouldn't quit. I mean, it was terrible aching. And, you know, he, we did a Zoom call earlier this week. It looks like he lost about 30 pounds. I mean, he is a he is a big guy. And actually, if you watch NBC, it's his brother, Jose, he has Blart, who does the, he's the uh, anchor uh, on the weekends, uh, usually Friday and Saturday night. He looks just like Mario. He's just a same facial, you know, he's a Cuban, came from Cuba before he was a, a U.S. citizen, fled Castro. Uh, but it's just like, so we know people. And we, we just know we have to work together. What, what do you see as uh, we've got a couple minutes left? Uh, what do you see if, if you kind of look now at maybe into the future? Um, and, you know, we've, we've had a, a lot of great conversations with CEOs in the last couple of weeks. And you hear a lot of the word unprecedented, unknown. Um, what, when you look out, you know, another year from where you're sitting and what you're hearing, what, what do you see as the kind of how the future might pan out? Do you have a point of view there? Of- a couple of things. Uh- got to make sure that workers are safe and they, and they have to know that they're safe. That's why, you know, I'm, I'm glad that the governor has taken this step uh, this last week to require that em- employers in retail uh, establishments, their employees have got to have a, a face mask. Uh, social distancing is important. And we as consumers, whether we go to the grocery store, the post office or the hardware store, wherever it is, we too have to have that mask, not only protect ourselves, but protect those employees. Uh, but I, I got to tell you, I think we're on the verge of uh, having the science and, and the wherewithal to actually develop a test relatively soon where people can determine right away whether they're positive or negative that's uh, going to be pretty close to 100%. And so as I look to the future, You'll be able to take that test and, and, you know, maybe it'll have a color strip or something like that. You'll be able to determine if you've been exposed, if you have those antibodies, and that you can then be with so proper social distancing again, be safe in the, in the job that you have. Uh, that's number one. Number two, we have to develop, we do have to develop you know, the right therapeutics and, and the vaccine. You know, I, I saw again just this morning a report, I've already been in touch with my, our committee staff. Where are we on a vaccine? Uh, and and it, it's gotta be safe. I worked big time on this bill, 21st Century Cures a couple years ago, and it made a, a remarkable strides in the right direction to, to speed up the approval of drugs and devices, which is gonna help us as we look at a vaccine. But uh, we, we need that too. And we have to, you know, as, as our state is, every state has experienced the, these problems. Uh, tremendous loss of revenue, whether it be you know, the, the sales taxes, payroll taxes, gas taxes, all those different things because we've been, we've been shut down. We have to make sure that our local community leaders do have the resources. The last thing that you want to do is well, cut back on healthcare workers or first responders or building roads or all of that because of the budget crisis. You got to make sure that those functions of government that we care about and, you know, <laughs> are adequately funded as we emerge from this. So, you know, I'm, I'm always an optimist. I'm actually a happy guy right now because even though I look like I've been in a man cave, I did find a remote. I'm a Cubs fan, and Sammy Sosa has hit six home runs in the last three nights on my Cubs channel, and I bet they don't lose a game this year uh, based on, on what they're doing. There so go. we got to work together. There's That's a way. Got to look at the upside. That's right. That's right. Well, we're almost out of time here. Um, so what I'd love to do is close with uh, some rapid fire questions. So yep. have you happened to see Inside the Actor Studio? Have you seen this show? No. Nah, okay. So it's on an artsy show and uh, it's, it's pretty fun. But uh, these are one word answers All right. uh, is what we're looking for. Are you ready to go? Yep. All right. Favorite leader? Reagan. Courage or compassion? Compassion. Speed or accuracy? I like them both. Uh, I better say accuracy. Liking or respect? Respect. Great ideas or great execution? 
execution, great ex execution. A word to describe your leadership. Idea. What's that? Not a good idea if you can't get it done. That's right. Uh, a word to describe your leadership style. Listener. And if you uh, had to pick an animal, a, a spirit animal that really embodied and illustrated your leadership, Fred, what would be your spirit animal? Uh, a puppy. A puppy. Yeah. Why, 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 why a puppy? Yeah, because we love dogs. You know, I got, you know, my son's got a puppy now and, and it's just like, I wish I could be there to see him. I mean, that's, you know, he's, he's in Denver, so it's, uh, it's hard to do, but he's, he's taking, you know, they, he's newly married. They don't have any kids. He's got this uh, puppy and it's like, oh man, I want to be there. Wonderful. Well, Fred, we, we so appreciate you taking time uh, from, a, I know, a, a really busy time. We're really appreciative of that. Um, and thanks so much. You bet. Take Thank care. you. Thank you.